In today's episode of the Choke Slam Wrestling Report, we have indie legend Steve Monster Mac. And we had a discussion last week where we had a uh, recorded session that he spoke about his career, how he started, his um, his history with Danny Math as part of the Hit Squad. So we spoke about his career and how he started and all the stuff that he's seen in the wrestling business and what goes on in the wrestling business now. So we're going to talk about that. But before we start the Chokesland Wrestling Report this week, we're going to give a 10 bell salute to Bray Wyatt. The man was a creative genius and now he is no longer with us. And of course, this past Thursday, while I was doing a podcast with Jay Santi and Whole Milk Mike, of uh, the turnbuckle tabloid, we were hit with the sad news of his passing. So with that, we're going to give the respect to the man and give him his 10 bell salute. And again, Bray Wyatt, thank you for all the memories and rest in peace, brother. Welcome to another episode of the Chokeslam Wrestling Report. I am your host, the infamous Ultimate One from New York City. And today I have a special guest. And this is three years in the making. I have no other than, I could say, a legend in the game, in the indie uh, spot, Mr. Steve Monster Mac. How are you today, brother? Chilling, chilling, bro. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. So um, the reason I wanted to bring you in, because it's been uh, about, what was the last time I saw you, Russ, was about three years ago, the Bronze Wrestling Federation. Um, and um, I remember um, the first time I saw you, you had a match with, uh, I know that guy named Tyree Taylor. Am I saying his sure. name right? Yep, and, Tyree. Yeah, I think he was the New York City champion at that time. And y'all mm-hmm. were feuding. And and I saw you and I was like, yo, this is this guy's a badass dude, bro. And 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 that match, I was right there in the front. I know you put him right through a through a damn door and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So um, and I got impressed, man. And I and I I went that night, I went in and, and tried to get in contact with you through you uh through Twitter. I send you the pitches. And um, so let me just start off. I mean, what made you go into wrestling? I know you started your debut was back in 1998, but what was your like the guys that actually influenced you to become a wrestler? So um, technically my first match was in 96, but I was untrained and uh, it wasn't on like a major show or it It was just a street fair. Uh, Low key. He's my cousin. Oh, Uh, really? Yes. Uh, He was was at my house and my mom was out that day. She came home. She told us there was a ring set up down the block from us on one of the street fairs. So uh, we ran up there and um, we uh, we asked the guy, we were like, oh, can we get some ring time? We're not thinking, you know, anything up because we just wanted to feel what it was like to get in the ring. We were longtime wrestling fans. Our grandparents were wrestling fans. Our parents were wrestling fans. So just natural that we were too. And, um, you know, the guy uh he let us in and uh he gave us five minutes and we had within two minutes of that you know about five thousand people to the street fair they were all surrounding the ring watching us mm. and from that point on we got the bug it was like it was insane you know what i mean At one point loki went for a moonsault and he kicked the street light and uh you know what are the traffic lights and, and everyone lost it so we were right there we we're like we can't get any bigger than that so we figured it out. We were like, that's it. Take it home. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. from that point on, uh, one of our boys, Low Life Louie, him and Mace Mendoza from Christopher Street Connection, they were uh, rent out this uh, ring at this church in Brooklyn. Um, it was Arena Puerto Rico, uh, Pedro Rodriguez. 
And uh, it was kind of from there. That's where everything just took off from us. That was in February. The street fair was October 96. February 97 is when we started working with Louie and our friends. And um, things just went nuts. I mean, we met Homicide. We met Latham, Bobby Lombardi, uh, Shaolin, Jay Lover, all these guys that would become very influential in our careers. And, um, you know, we always loved wrestling. So it was like, it was just a natural fit. And uh, for whatever reason, we just had good, good ring presence. We had the athletic ability. I was playing football for my high school. I went to Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn and uh, oh. played for the Tigers. And, um, you know, it just, he went, uh, he was, Key was living, Key was originally from Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, but uh, he moved to Jersey during his high school uh, life, career, or whatever you want to call it. And he played for North Bergen up there for a season, pretty half a season, something like that. But like we always were athletic, and uh, next thing you know, we're in wrestling, and it just felt natural to us, you know. Uh, it, it's because it, I was doing my research, like I said, I did my little research here. I know like, Homicide is one of the guys they train you, but mm-hmm. I also see you got Manny Fernandez who also trained you. And I know he was a rugged type dude because I watched yeah, Manny, Manny Fernandez. Fernandez uh, I mean, he was known as the Raging Bull for a reason. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, if you got him pissed off, he definitely gave you the horns. You know what I'm saying? But uh, Manny was living in Jersey for a hot minute. And uh, by this point, we were already wrestling for Jersey All-Pro. But Manny would come down to the school. And uh, he, you know, for about, I, th- I want to say about six months, give or take, he put us under his wings and... Um, me, Homicide, Key, and Moff were his top four uh, students that he was training. I have Crazy Ivan, too, because Crazy Ivan was training under him. And, um, you know, he took us under his wing, and anything that he had, he made sure that he threw a bone our way. And uh, that was pretty much, I mean, we spent a lot of time with him in and out of the ring. Um, he uh, was part of that West Texas clique. Terry Funk, Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody. Uh, Derek Murdoch, Derek Murdoch also, he compared, right? He compared, he often compared his group to our group, and we always took that as a sign of, oh man, this is that's what's up, that's serious. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because I know Matt, Manny Fernandez, he will always live with that um, that match he had with Invader. I think Invader won in Puerto Invader Rico. Three. Is it Invader three? Three? Yeah. Was it three? I saw mm-hmm. that. I remember watching that. I, that was like a horror show for me. I was like fourteen. <laughs> I saw that. I was like, oh my god, he's bleeding from. And, and you know, but I, I read an article about that, how, how it happened, whatever. And Manny kind of explained to this, but you know, Manny Fernandez, yeah, he he was no joke in his heyday. So, and speaking about Matt, because I know he was called Mafia back then. Mm-hmm. You guys been teaming up probably for over twenty plus years, something like that. Um, I mean, do you guys well? I, I mean, to this day, y'all like brothers because y'all y'all got the same ring style, like. He he's he's a, a rugged type dude. He hits hard. So I mean, because I, I noticed that you guys started off in Jersey Pro as a tag team, and that they were called the Hit Squad, mm-hmm. right? And, yes. Um, and then he turned on you on Ring of Honor, um, during the Hades of Ring of Honor. I mean, what still, even though there's a betrayal between you, what brings you guys back? I mean, is it the chemistry as far as the tag team or what? So uh, let me bring it back to the beginning. Uh, my used to come to Jersey all pro wrestling fan, uh, wrestling shows. Mm-hmm. He would be sitting in the front as a fan. He was this big, loud Puerto Rican dude. And <laughs> we had a group called the Nation of Immigration. It was Homicide, myself, Don Montoya, Kane D, Chino Martinez, and Low Life Louie. And um, we were the Puerto Ricans against the whites. So Moff would have his flag, his jersey. He'd be front row representing Matt Hart. And... Um, and one day he decided to come to the uh, Jersey All Pro School, and um, you know, it, they put us together right away. And at first, there was resistance on my part because I was doing singles, I was traveling the country already, I was doing a whole bunch of things, and I didn't want to have a tag team partner. I didn't want to have to train somebody new. And you know, I was just I'm learning this stuff myself, and now I got to stop, reset, learn someone new, deal with his nuances and figure out what's the best thing that's going to work for us. But we had interesting chemistry. Um, Back then, before he had all the tattoos, 
if you were filming, it was hard to tell which one was which. There's yeah, no, yeah, you, my mom yeah. is like, that's you. I'm like, no, that's Danny. Yeah, yeah, I used to mean? look alike. Yeah, I saw yeah. A, a, a early <laughs> yeah. video. And y'all look alike. I'm like, which is yeah. who? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and, and the only way I could ever tell was how the hands were taped. He taped his one hand like a boxer, and I had strips going across my knuckles. That was the only way I could tell. Um, but most of the time, you know, it was hard to tell us apart. And uh, we had great chemistry that was made even greater by being in the ring with guys like the Haas brothers. Haas brothers, we were their tackling dummies, we were their training dummies. And Russ and Charlie, they were no joke. Uh, they were shooters from uh, Seton Hall, from Oklahoma, by way, you know, Oklahoma, by way of Seton Hall. Yeah. Um, they were just amazing athletes, the two of them. And um, being in the ring with them and learning how to do, go through the ropes with them made us even stronger. So, you know, we had like a five-year run there. Uh, we could do the turn in Ring of Honor. We were supposed to do more, but I ended up getting fired by Ring of Honor. Really? That, uh, well... I kind of threatened uh, the promoter at the time. <laughs> so he was like, oh, you're suspended. And then I come back for when I'm supposed to, you know, I come to the show up at the show. I'm supposed to come back. And it's like, no, I fired you. I was like, you said I was suspended, but whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so then he does his thing. We do our, I do my thing. And then um, <laughs> fast forward to about 98, I'm sorry, 2008, 2009. Um, we end up, teaming up again and uh we had chemistry but we did that only lasted like maybe a couple of months and then uh in 2015 beyond wrestling uh had wanted to have us on a show and that one show ended up being about three or four years where we teamed up and i always say the same thing we could go years without talking put us anywhere near a ring and it'll be like we saw each other yesterday you know, yeah, I just had that chemistry. I don't know what, you know, what build, what bonds were given to us that we have that chemistry. But no matter what, you know, I could be mad at him. He could be mad at me. I and mean, we're not right now. We're cool. You know what I'm saying? But like, he's doing his thing and I'm doing mine. And no matter what's going on, we'll get back in the ring. And it says, if nothing ever happens, you know, it's just one of those things. I can't describe it. Uh, I've got better chemistry with him than I do with some people in my family. You know what I mean? And it's very weird. But for whatever reason, the hit squad was meant to happen. You know what I mean? We were meant to cross paths. Yeah, I, I was checking your accolades, man. It's like everything is with him. Uh, if I, if you don't mind running down some of the yeah, stuff, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't even know if you even see the stuff that you have done in the past <laughs> 20 something years with this guy. I, the only thing that I know is that over the 26 years that I've been in the ring, I've had... Um, just it might be 90 now, uh, 90 different title reigns um, with most of them being tag teams with about 15 tag partners, most of them with Moff. And then Kyle yeah, yeah. Be, be, KTB would be the second partner that I had the most success with. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. With Moff, we had Jersey All Pro a bunch of times, mm -hmm. JCW, the original JCW, yeah. we had GCW. Uh, mm -hmm. We had JCW was relaunched through Tag Gems, uh, USA Pro, ICW, uh, you name it, we had it. We were the first Ring of Honor, uh, anything that you saw in Ring of Honor, we were the first match, uh, mm. even though it's disputed by some because it wasn't a match that was announced. It was still a three count. We had the first match. We beat the Christmas Street Connection uh, to yeah. start off Ring of Honor history. Um, I mean – everything uh in the last few years we had tournament for tomorrow for beyond tournament for tomorrow for uh we had the samoan cup um for uh samu uh i mean there's been so much stuff that we've been partners for uh as, as far as success in our careers and uh we'll be forever linked no matter what yeah i'm, I'm looking at this and it's like you guys had usa pro wrestling extreme tag champs four mm -hmm. times uh, four times with Map, two times with Havoc, one time with Louis Ramos, WXW Tag Team Champion, two times with Map. I mean, I was writing this down. I was like, yo, this guy might as well just live with this guy, Map. I mean, you had all the damn tag team belts. Yeah, at one time, uh, we had seven titles. So, like, we yeah, see, like, TJ that. Marconi and Vicious Vicky displaying all their belts. Uh, it's cute and all, but I did that 20 years ago. Yeah, I know. I saw that. I read that. I was like, 
I said this guy had one tag team on another, and they had six more at the yep. same time. I'm like, yep. do you guys have to carry all that? Or yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually oh, we took one picture with all the belts when we had them. So it was 14 titles. But what we did was um, we laid them on the floor. And mm-hmm. we stood, you know, we laid next to them and took pictures that way because it was just too heavy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can imagine. I mean, it's funny because I, I was at House of Glory this past Friday and uh, I took a picture with Akira. He's like, mm-hmm. he's the middleweight champion for MLW. Plus, he has the tag team belt. So mm-hmm. he held the middleweight and then he made me, he told me, hey, you carry the, 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 the tag team belt. And it's heavy. It's like 10 pounds. So I can imagine you guys carrying 70 pounds in a bag. Yeah, I mean, it was... Back then, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty crazy because like nobody at that time really trusted tag teams because you got to think about it. You got to trust two guys, and they got to trust two other guys that they're going to show up and do whatever and be reliable. And it was harder for them to put tag teams in the main event. But then uh, Moff and I come around, and the SAT come around, and New York all of a sudden is the hop in place for tag teams and. Jersey All Pros started it. They put us in the main event first. And then Frank Goodman and uh, USA Pro and ICW, they started putting us in the main event. Next thing you know, we're winning all the titles and, you know, having all the main event matches. And um, it was like for like a three year run there. It was like pretty crazy because, you know, we had to remember where we had to be, which titles we got to bring, who we're going to wrestle, what clothes we're going to wear because we always had different sets. We had a green set, we had a yellow set, an orange set, a red set, a black set. So we had to remember, you know, coordinate all that <laughs> stuff. It sounds silly, but, you know, trust me, it was hectic because, and, you know, when when you don't know and you're not remembering because you got 85 things going on, it's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> I mean, have you have your body taken a beating from all this time? I mean, because I know I, I speak to wrestlers that be like, oh, you know, my knee hurts. I get up with pain. Um, um is it is it is it that way for you right now? Because I mean, you're still young. You're still like 45. Am I correct? 44, but I well, feel like I'm next 94. year. 94. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I got like my back, my neck, my shoulders. Uh, all those years of giving clotheslines have definitely messed up my right shoulder. Um, mm. It's definitely I feel it every day. Uh, my back is definitely a mess. Uh, my knees are a mess. I'm a bigger guy too, so even if I didn't have wrestling. I still have those pains, but with the wrestling, it intensifies it. And like, I get yelled at because I don't like doing, I don't like taking meds. I don't like taking pain pills. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. Uh, It's not because I'm better than anybody else, but it's because I have a phone full of people who died from overdoses and addictions. And, you know, and, and that always puts me in my place of like, hey, stupid, you know, it could get, you could get easily addicted to this stuff. And then wait, not wake up. And I, I've got a daughter. She's turning 10 this month. I want to be there when she's 40, 50. I mean, I'm pretty sure I won't be. But if I can make it there as close as I can, then I'll be happy. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, because um, especially during the uh, 2000, I think it was around 2006, 2007, that was when you were hearing all these people dying at a young age because of the pills and all that stuff, you know? So, I mean, it's a smart move, um, you know, but you know, I I, I want to see you keep wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Because you're still young, bro. You're well, still young. I don't know how much time I got left in the ring. No. Uh, I'm I'm seeing I'm at the end of the tunnel. You know what I mean? And it's not because um, I suck or anything like that, but I just want to be able to move in a couple of years and not have to worry about being in a wheelchair or looking, you know, like trash when I'm in the ring. Like I, I sometimes I see some of those guys and it's depressing. You know, I mean, I was in the movie, The Wrestler, and that's what that's all about. A guy who just didn't know when to quit. And uh, I don't want to be that guy. I never wanted to be that guy. You know, I always want, if you see my name, you're going to see quality. You're going to see something different than everybody else. And, you know, if I can't provide that, then I don't want to be in the ring doing it. It's not fun for me at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, one one match I know is coming up for you, and and, and there was a match you had about I say in May, and it was against PJ Savage. I saw that match. You guys like two big pit bulls in there, and you got the best of him. Now I know you guys are wrestling again. And when is it the day? If you refresh my September memory, September sixteenth. Yeah, for uh, Blaze of Glory for Titan Championship Wrestling at uh, 
the Highline Arena in Aberdeen, New Jersey. Yeah. So, I mean, Savage is a beast because this guy, he hits hard. You two guys are like, when I saw that match on YouTube, I was like, wow. It was like, I felt like I was watching New Japan Strong Style type of wrestling. Thank you. I mean, are you ready again for him? Because he, I mean, this guy, he gets better and better in that ring every time I see him. Um, are you going to, I mean, are you ready for that again? Well, so after having that first match with him, and it's easy to see that the tradition that Moff, myself, Homicide, and Keith started with New York wrestling, you know, and that, that includes guys like Red and the SAT and Brian Excel, you know, and all the stuff that we went through, if he was old enough to be a part of it with us, he would have been right there surviving and thriving. You know what I mean? Been on top. He would have fit right in with those guys. But, um, you know, when when you're in there with him, he is a savage. He does hit hard. You know, even when he just runs into you and he's not trying to hit you, you're getting knocked. You know what I mean? Um, first match I took, uh, using my brain. You know what I mean? He thought he had me, and I rolled him up. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, I've been giving him his props, and, uh, you know, I, I gave him his respect. I've been giving him his respect. Uh, last couple of shows for Titan, there's been uh, a little bit of a difference of opinion. Uh, we were down in North Carolina last week. Uh, I was about to win my match in the three-way against Gangone, the champ, and Johnny Moran, the former champ. And the Savage came in. And he speared me, and I got pinned. So mm. that's just putting more fuel to the fire. You know what I mean? Oh, and, uh, you know, we still have another show on September 2nd before we get to the 16th. So we might have the match there, <laughs> mess around. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, PJ Savage, uh, on, on all honesty, uh, he's the future of not only New York wrestling, but indie wrestling. You know, um, He's got a lot going for him. The crowd loves him everywhere. They loved him down in North Carolina. First time seeing him, they fell in love real quick with him. And um, when you're in my position where you know you're going to be running shows and, you know, being in charge of locker rooms, that's someone that you want in, in your locker room with you. you know, that's someone that, you know, you know that he's going to bring the fire every show, whether it's five people or 5,000 people. And, um, yeah need a lot more guys who have that burning heart and desire like pj savage yeah um now that you mentioned that uh have you seen any improvement i mean from the time you've been in pro wrestling 20 plus years have where do you see where do you see wrestling as a whole and i'm talking about independent the big name promotion do you do you see it thriving higher or you see this problem as far as uh, because I saw I saw a, a video where a guy tried to do an elbow drop from God knows thirty feet from some stage and missed the guy completely on the, on the table. Uh, do you see wrestling getting better, or is it getting crazy because wrestling uh, wrestlers are trying to entertain these fans that think that killing yourself for them is worth it? So you said it yourself. You went to House of Glory on Friday. Yeah. And if you stay for the whole show, you saw um, Red and Brian Excel take on the main event. Yes. The main event are two guys that over the last year I've had a lot of in ring time with. Mm -hmm. Those are guys that are the better part of pro wrestling. Um, there's a lot of talent uh, who I watch and I see. And all they really need is just a veteran voice to just show them like, hey, if you just do this instead of that, look at the difference. You know, notice the difference, watch the difference. Not, you need to do this, you need to do that. When you have someone teaching like that, they're never going to pick it up, especially with today's generation. Mm -hmm. They very much are resistant to being told what to do. Um, part of the problem that today's not just wrestling, but today's world is the feeling of entitlement and how high it is. Everyone feels like you should give them this. You should give them that. You ain't got to do nothing. I saw somebody the other day ask for 
oh, you know, you should take into account the money that I spend to get to a show and food and stuff like that. And you're right, they should. But you know where that comes in? When you put your price at a certain range and match your effort in the ring with that price. Because then it's showing that the diet, the workout, the gym, the travel, that is paying off because you're giving a better quality event. Don't sit there and tell me you need to blah, blah. Nobody needs to do anything. Stop feeling that you're owed anything. Get out of the feelings part. That's the problem with a lot of wrestling today. There's so much, my feelings are hurt. Nobody gives a damn about your feelings. You show up, you get paid, you wrestle, you go home. That's it. That's all you got to do. But when you start putting into account, well, he said I'm black instead of white or yellow instead of red or green instead of gray. And you start worrying about that. That's where you got to worry about the person's mental capacity to handle pro wrestling. Doesn't matter what you, you know, back in the days, you had guys that didn't care. You had guys that did this for money to feed their family. So they hustled. Their hustle game was insane. And they did what they had to do to make money. Right now, it's become more of an athletic event where there's more, um, oh, look what I could do rather than look why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so that has to change. You got to start changing psychology. You know, um, a lot of these people think because, you know, they hit their leg on the canvas and they grab their knee for you know, two seconds that that's selling. That's not selling. You want people to believe? You want people to understand that you're in pain? You want people to read and want to cheer you on to do better? You don't want them to be like, oh, okay, and then move on to the next thing. But that has to be taught. That has to be learned. That has to be explained. And right now, there's not enough guys doing that. Um, So once that starts happening, once you start explaining, see, you, you brought it up right away, Manny Fernandez. Manny Fernandez is the definition of old school. Like I said, he grew up with the West Texas guys. Ted DiBiase, Tito Santana, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, both punks, Tully Blanchard. Dick all Murdoch. those guys came from West Texas. They all learned the same style. You go back to Giant Baba, who went to Terry Funk and Dory Funk to learn how to wrestle. And Onita and all these other guys who came from Japan and wherever. They all learned West Texas. There was the the psychology. Yeah, you had to be tough. Yeah, you had to be able to take a shot. That comes with the game no matter what. Because we always say the same ballerinas. This is definitely, you know, a rugged <laughs> sport. Ballerinas. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's you know, true, though. It's true. because no, um, Exactly. You know, they, they, you know, a lot of these kids, they got the wrong impression. They think it's all, let's choreograph this whole sequence where we're ole and ole and miss me and whatever. And then it ends with someone getting dropped in their head and that's wrestling. It's yeah. Not, yeah. It's true. It's Cause not. I was, I was at a, at a show in September of last year and this guy was like, uh, I don't remember the guy's name because it's been so long, but it was like, this guy was like at least six foot five. Mm-hmm. And he tried to do a, a hurukarana from the top rope. And I'm saying to myself, why are six foot five trying to do a hurukarana on top of three guys down there, we all know they're going to try to hold on. He missed the guys completely and landed on the hardwood floor. They had to take him out. And I'm like, and and, and it, after seeing that, and, you know, I've been following wrestling forever, and and the stuff that I see in wrestling and then the, the, you know, online, I'm like, these guys are not, you know, they're not, they think everything is uh, acrobatic stuff, you know? And um, I, I spoke, I remember Chris Case talking about that to me one time. That they don't listen, they do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Um, TJ Marconi sometimes goes online and he speaks his mind off, and people are like, Oh, no, you shouldn't say that, but it needs to be heard. Yeah, well, see, TJ Marconi, he'll get in trouble because he's saying what should be said, but yeah. then he'll do his rope walk cro- clothesline. Which, when you're in there with bigger guys, yeah, sure, definitely do it, stand out, mm-hmm. whatever. But if you're in there with smaller guys, Marconi should be just destroying them by throwing them and mm-hmm. you know, launching them, you know, whatever. But, you know, when you're in there with the bigger guy, it's a different story. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I could do the run off the second rope. I've done it a bunch of times. 
you know, at first it was just the guys like TJ Marconi and DJ Hyde, the bigger guys. But then, you know, as I got in there with guys that I know that could work, you know, I did it with when it when I needed to do it out of desperation. You know, yeah. and every once in a while I would throw it in, like when we wrestled Gargano and Chapa. I threw mm-hmm. it in there because I knew people were going to be watching. They're going to see some big old fat dude <laughs> doing a run off the second yeah, to some yeah. young stud that's going to come yeah. out dope. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you got to pick and choose your spots. But at the same time, you got to be smart. You, 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 like you just said, the dude got hurt. And for what? Trying to show off. And I bet you he went to the back. Did it look all right? No, it looked bad, stupid. Uh, he, he, <laughs> I mean, I was selling my shirts there. And when he hit that floor, I was like, oh, my God. Because he missed everything. He didn't. He didn't touch anybody. He, I was yep. like, why are you doing that? And it's funny because, uh, I mean, they, I know they do practice before they do all this stuff, but it wasn't even necessary. Like, mm-hmm. you had two guys. The guys, they had three guys that were shorter than him, and he missed everybody. So, And that's the crazy like, thing. Like, fans today, like, if you watch stuff from the 80s and 90s, fans didn't care if wrestlers missed spots. Yeah. They, they, they just accepted that it was a fight, and stuff happens sometimes. You go for mm-hmm. a high risk. Hyrus maneuver didn't pay yeah. off. You know what I mean? But like today, these fans think that everything they know and everything that they see is what it is. Sometimes people throw in Sabu doesn't really talk much. I love yeah. Sabu. He's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And he's actually one of the coolest guys I've ever been in a, room, in a locker room with. One of my favorite people, right? Not everybody loves Sabu, but Sabu the other day just admitted sometimes he would do stuff where he would miss on purpose. He could nail it every time. And he would miss because the fans thought they knew what was going to happen. And, and that's not always the case. The fans mm-hmm. don't know everything. They, they can't know if they're not in the back and know what's going on. You know what I mean? So while, you know, if, if for the older generation, they don't want to admit that, you know, kayfabe is dead. kayfabe has been dead. But at the same time, you don't have to keep Shoveling down people's mouth. Hey, look, I'm breaking the fourth wall. No, give them a little bit to ponder. Like, oh, was that what was supposed to happen? Or was that, you know what I mean? Like, that was cool what I just saw. You know what I mean? But a lot of these wrestlers think, I'm going to let them know by letting you know they're part of the show. I'm like, no, don't do that. Because these fans, a lot of them already think they know more than the wrestlers. And they don't. And, and, a lot and, of them and, never left their couch. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, and it's the thing is, this fan, these fans nowadays, they they too too deep into a wrestler's life, like they want to know every little thing, and, yep. and you know, a situation like what I mean with Cash Wheeler, what happened to him, and somebody posted his arraignment. I'm like, this is why it's gotten to the point where wrestlers can't have a private life. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. you got to be all in it. I mean, I'm sure you probably don't want that. I mean, you don't want your kids having some crazy fan. Like, hey, hey. Sh- Mac, let me get your autograph. You know what I'm saying? When you're in the middle of relaxing. You know? So part of the reason why I don't put everything on social media, why I have two private pages, mm-hmm. is because at a show, uh, my ex-wife and my two friends were with my daughter. My daughter was, I think, two or three at the time. And there was a fan that she was on my Facebook page. And she had approached my daughter. Oh, you're so cute. Whatever. You know, not, you're not thinking anything of it. And then she kept saying, I would love to take you home and for you to be my daughter and like in front of my ex wife. So at that point, I was like, get her away. (laughs) And she got blocked, deleted, never saw her. I mean, I I would see her in shows, but like, you know, you got to keep your distance because you just never know. Listen, I'm nobody. You know what I mean? Like, you might think I'm an indie legend, but in reality, on the face of the, I'm nobody. I'm just some short fat guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but for this girl to act like that, it showed me like you can't trust anybody because yeah. you just never know. You know what I mean? I mean so it, it it is very wacky and weird to have that happen. But at the same time, if you're gonna be someone that, especially like the generation today, that they're very much fan interactive, where they're constantly talking with fans and dealing with fans because you know IWTV and whatever. Fight TV, whatever else puts them on that platform, and they're with the fans, you know, all the time, and they're cool with them or whatever. You just gotta watch your back because you just never know who's plotting. You know what I mean? Someone sees you. I know this kid's gonna get to WWE. You know what? Hmm, wheels are turning. Uh, he's gonna have mo- money one day. He's gonna have to owe me money. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. 
It's but you really, people crazy. are crazy. I tell you, they, they they stop wrestlers in the in the airport for signature to sign their they little uh the little toy, whatever. Because I mm-hmm. see it. I go to House of Glory a lot, and I go to these meet and greet. And, you know, I get my pictures, whatever, get my little autograph. But these people be coming with a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, sign this, sign that. And I'm like, oh, like, that's not even for to, just to sell it for eBay. You know what I'm saying? It's just ridiculous. So, anyway, thank but you wait, very much. Real quick, good. real quick. Last okay, week, okay. I was sitting with Haku, and uh-huh. what happened was the locker room that we used, they were using for uh, the meet and greet for all the legends that were at the event in North Carolina. Oh, so, yeah. Haku's at one table, and I'm chilling there. I got my bag there. We're talking. And all of a sudden, a guy who worked the event, he had two pictures. One, like a 1980s uh, WWE promo pic of Haku. And then the other side was a, a 90s Ming picture, right? So he was like, I got two pictures. Could you do me a favor and sign them? Haku was like, yeah, sure. Haku, sweetest guy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no problem, buddy. All of a sudden, he takes the pictures out. And they both have post-it notes. And it's... Mm-hmm. Could you just make it out what's on the post at all? It's like, dear, whatever, you're my best friend, blah, blah, blah. And, like, he's, like, exactly like that. Haku's like, but you asked me to do your favor. A favor is just me putting my name, and that's yeah. it. You go, oh, well, you know, I, I I mean, since I have you, whatever. He's like, so Haku does it. And as he's doing the second one, the guy's like, wait, wait, wait you forgot. And Haku goes, buddy, I got to tell you, you're annoying me. I'm going to get up and bite your nose. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the best part of the weekend for me because you know that's some real nonsense right there like you can't you know, if you're gonna ask for a favor a favor is one thing you know, like he said a favor is just putting his name and that's it but if you have more listen and it doesn't seem right in some aspects but at the same time he should be asking for more money you know or any money because like, i didn't pay any money you know what i mean yeah, yeah. Should so he did. That, so he signed it as a favor. Yeah, didn't even charge him. Yeah, Exa- oh. yeah. didn't charge him. But what? this is what I'm saying. So instead of the guy being happy that he even just signed it and you know whatever, oh no no no, can you just make it exactly like that? And it was like, come on, bro, you can't be like that. You know what I mean? Like, like he said, doing a favor. Favor is just putting your name, and that's it. Thank you. Shake your hand. Oh, you want to take a picture? Yeah, sure, no problem. You know what I mean? But yeah, you don't you don't want to get how cool man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I, I remember they, I, I remember when Bullet Club had that thing in Jersey, and this group called for the podcast called What's Culture. Mm-hmm. They did something that Haku came out. He wanted to kill them. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were, stuff. but they were all working with each other. Oh, okay. Was, uh, I thought cause yeah. that shit looked real. I mean, I saw, <laughs> <laughs> nah, they were all working. Daughter said, "Dad, Dad." I'm like, "Oh shit, <laughs> he's about to kill somebody, yo." And, <laughs> I'm and I can tell guy. he's a badass dude. Like, you know, could be probably the sweetest guy in the world, but, you mm-hmm. know, some people push the button. So let me tell you a quick funny story, though. Um, I think the last time I saw you was probably a week before they closed down everything, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I brought my um, my goddaughter's little brother to the event. Mm-hmm. And you, I think you opened the, the, the show in a match. I forgot who it was. I think it was with Brando Lee. Yes, Brandon mm-hmm. Lee. Yes, I wasn't sure if it was Brandon Lee or not. Yeah, but because that I was guess, my I, first I, defense of the New York City title. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. we were just trying to have some fun with that. And I don't know, it was you that came with a with a glowing mask, or Brandon Lee came out with a glowing mask, like in the lights. And I remember my 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 god uh, my god, those little brother went to the front and he saw it and he kind of ran back. He started crying when you started chopping the shit out of Brandon Lee. I was talking about you was hitting him. Blah, blah. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, oh, I'm scared. I'm like, but he's not chopping you. He's chopping him. Yo, the kid got so scared. I had to call his mother. Astro Morales had to calm the kid down. That was hilarious. I'm like, because he was like, yeah, I'll go to the rest and show. Yeah, I want to have fun. But when he saw you and you chopped the shit out of Brandon Lee like two or three times, he was like terrified. Yeah, I used to go out to those Bronx shows because yeah. legit, I'm not a fan of the Bronx. I've never been. I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn yeah, yeah, and Bronx yeah, yeah, yeah. is always going to be the beef. You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. Um, I used to always try to start riots whenever I would wrestle in the Bronx. Like, my goal was to have the cops come because, like, I want to get those people so mad at me. And, like, when I hit the one line one time of, oh, I didn't know the building accepted EBT as a form of payment for tickets. Now, <laughs> oh! You know what I, mean? yeah, I remember like, you, you did. You, 
you did a promo uh, on Taylor mm-hmm. before he came into the ring, and you said something about the Bronx and you from Brooklyn. This and people were just boo. Yeah. I was like, that's yeah. that's getting heat right there. That's, you know? But that's that's what the whole thing is. Like that's some real nonsense on my end. That I've never been a fan of the Bronx. I had a girlfriend that one way back when that lived in the Bronx when I first started wrestling, and like she had an apartment all to herself. And like you would think as a young single guy, you want to hang out, girl at the apartment, come to my house in Staten Island where my mom and my sister are. I'd rather be there than the Bronx. <laughs> Man, I'm just, <laughs> you know, like, the Bronx, you know the Bronx I mean? like, is crazy, yo. Yeah, but like that's that's just how I felt about the Bronx. You know what I mean? So it was, it's always been natural. It's something that it's easy to bring out to me because. Mm-hmm. I'm a Mets fan. I hate the Yankees. You know. Um, oh damn! I got the Yankee yeah, hat. No, I know. I mean, I can listen. I can. I can. At my older age, sports have yeah. become less of a thing for me because uh, I just hate how soft everything is. Like, yeah. Growing yeah. up, you know, we had wild times, and like, there's a reason why so many old videos are shared today rather than new videos. And yeah, like, yeah. the only thing you've seen recently is um when that dude swung on the other dude knocked him out last week or the week before you know what i'm saying like because that's a throwback to you know the the old which video which video is that um there's a dude stealing i forget the names because i'm just not into like the team you know the team names and the the players and stuff but there was um a guy who's uh sliding into second um, oh, I know you're talking about a Tim Anderson and, and Ramirez fight. Yes, and, and the dude got knocked out. The face and he fell down like a UFC fight. Yeah. That got so much burn, and nobody even knew that the All Star game was like two weeks before that. Nobody knew yeah. like anything else was going on in baseball, but they knew about that because that yeah. was like I said a throwback to the days where guys used to slide in a second with cleat first to try to take out the guy on second. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, it's to me that football, basketball, all these sports are so much softer now. Uh, and then I get it. They, you know, CTE is a thing and let's try to protect, you know, but like when you see like people throwing out guys running into home and clocking the catcher, right. And they're throwing that guy out and it's like, uh, why yeah, do I it's, a new, it's a new rule now. They, 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 yeah. they are protecting the catcher, you know. Yeah, I, of I course. And the same thing like the quarterback in the NFL, you know, I, I'm not about – I'm listen, if you go into football, you will go into football knowing that if you make it to the pros, there's a chance you're not going to remember most of your career because you could catch headshots every game. You know, had in practice, you know. I remember in practice one time I got knocked out during one drill. I woke up a drill later on another spot, and I went through oh. cruise control. You know what I mean? Like, mm. you know, it, it's scary when you think about it, but then you're like, oh, that's just part of the game. You know what I mean? Do I have CT? Probably. I'm pretty sure. I took a lot of chair shots in my day. I wrestled in the late 90s, early 2000s, where chair shots were going out like crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, but the chair shots back then, they weren't like the chair shots now. Back well, then, I mean, they, now they, they don't even the go to the head. They protect, you know, they go to the back, whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm absolutely 1,000% perfectly fine with that because you know i i don't want anybody getting hurt i don't want anybody getting to a point where they can't remember whatever right but at the same time there's certain things that are being taken away and it's like uh it's already like you already feel like this country's soft with a lot of the things that they do uh and then when you get into wrestling wrestling's a rough and tumble you know sport <laughs> whether you see it as sports entertainment or a sport it's still kind of a sport because you kind of got to be physically competitive. You got to be physically active. Um, there's more of a demand. And like, you know, yeah, I come off like a dinosaur. I know because I like that stuff. I like the contact. I like the days of, oh, he got smashed right there. You know what I mean? I don't like the, it's, that's just the, acro- the acrobatic stuff. Yeah. Think- like it's cool. I- it's cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. It's cool to watch, especially when you see it in person. But after you see it two times, you don't want to see it again. There's yeah. never enough times that people will not be satisfied with seeing someone get hit hard. When you see, like, remember back in the day, Monty Brown used to do the pounce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the reason why the pounce was such a great move because he was trucking the dude, you know, mm-hmm. and you could see that. Even if the guy gave a little boost, he still was launching. And I, I've been next to Monty Brown. I know how big he is. I know how strong he is. You know what I'm saying? So – 
you know that Monty Brown was throwing the dude. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, when you see stuff like that, that's why, you know, guys like me, Moff, you know, uh, some of these bigger, harder, heavier hitters, you know, um, Jeff Cobb, you know, when you see guys like that hit, you know that there's contact. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not oh, just, yeah, oh, they're working with each other. No, there's there's force being thrown. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not everybody's on that level. But and even I'm not on that level anymore. I used to be, but as I'm getting older, you know, you settle down a little bit. But like even then, you know, when you see like a PJ Savage and he's trucking people, you're like, that's what I want to see more of. I don't care about seeing the flips. You're gonna see a hundred flips a show. Yeah. But when you see someone get trucked like that, that to me is what you know. For most people, I assume, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I know from what I've seen. The bigger reaction is when someone gets hit hard, not yeah. when people do a twisty flip. And it's, that, and it's nothing against those guys because I like working with those guys too. I like making sure that they know how to tell their stuff and have it make sense when they're doing it, why they're doing it. But when you see two guys do it and they're trying to get a spot and all they're doing is flip after flip after flip, it exposes them. You know what I mean? Yeah, you don't want yeah. that to happen. You want to make yeah. sure that people come back to see, want to see more of you. Not see you one time, be happy, and never come back. I think it's one of the reasons why I'm more of a fan of New Japan Pro Wrestling because it's that's more contact, uh, strong style. You know, like you mentioned, Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb, that guy when he hits you, a uh, Minoru Suzuki. That guy when he hits you, you 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 hear it and you felt it as a fan. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we don't we. we I, I mean, like I said, I've been watching wrestling probably. I mean, I'm 53 now. So I've been watching wrestling since when it was in channel channel forty one WWF back then. Yes. You know, the Bruno San Martino days. And I look how wrestling has changed throughout the years. More as since the I think since the attitude era, I always blame the attitude era for changing everything. Um and now we see too many guys doing flips and you get tired of it. You know, I'm like, Oh, I already know he's gonna do it. Oh, he's gonna do this. It's like you could point out there's nothing special, you know. Yeah. So that's why like guys like yourself. Danny Math, PJ Savage in the Indies, and you know uh, the Chris Cage, Marconi, you know rough and tumble type thing. I like that instead of the guy just flying. Next thing you know, he's hitting the floor and missing everything. You know, yeah. so yeah. But um, I mean, it, yeah. it's also you got to look at the generation after the Attitude Era, like when John Cena and them were taking over. Mm-hmm. You know, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, those guys, Charlie Haas, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, those guys. They were doing their thing. Yeah, yeah. But because the Attitude Era left such a big footprint, yeah. the next generation, it was hard for them to overcome the shadow that was left behind by the Attitude Era. I mean, mm-hmm. it's 20 plus years later, we still talk about the Attitude Era as if it's the greatest of all time. There was a yeah. lot of fumbles in the Attitude Era. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? A lot of fumbles. Yeah. The, the hits were great. Don't get me wrong. But there was a lot of fumbles. And people don't, they see things with rose tinted glasses on. You know what I'm saying? They don't yeah. see that there was those fumbles. They just see the greatness that was Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Mankind, whatever. They don't realize that for all that, there was all kinds of stuff going on with like Kai and Time, Val Venus, and the oddities and whatever else, you know, that they were doing that they didn't really take serious. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, you know, the next generation, they were working really hard. If you look, Almost all those guys did New Japan. The guys in the next generation. Mm-hmm. You know, Brock Lesnar, yeah. Shelton, uh, Eddie Guerrero, Benoit. They were all New Japan guys. So they were trying to bring it to the States. Yeah. But, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't translate well into TV. And while they had some great runs, if you look, nobody, it's like kind of looked at like a dark time in WWE era. And yeah. I, I say that because at the time, WWE was the only thing going. Yeah, ECW was true. gone. ECW was gone. You know, that's what made the attitude era great was there was competition. So, like, you know, you had a lot of different areas to watch wrestling. And then once all that was gone, it was just WWE. People were so sour on it. That's when UFC started to blow up. And you know, there's other things happening that people were watching and watching less of wrestling. You know, um, and I think and I think you guys as the indie indie guys. We're not getting the recognition like it was supposed to, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, if there wasn't a camera or somebody recording it, nobody knew you was doing your thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I remember, yeah. I remember my stepson. 
was the one who pretty much introduced me to Ring of Honor because he had a friend and they had DVDs of Ring of Honor when the Briscoes first started, you know, and I and I knew about Ring of Honor because of I used to collect wrestling magazine, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated, that which you was uh I, I believe you was in two was it two thousand what was it that you was I was in a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they, I, I, the one I got online was 2003 you was ranked 265 out of the top 500 mm -hmm. so you know so that back then you know i used to get the pro illustrated because it gave me all the info who was out there this and this and that so i didn't know much of independent it wasn't until i say 2012 when i went to a ring of honor show at the hammerstein mm -hmm. ballroom and that's when i saw kevin steen which is now kevin owens um davy richards and all these guys that were there and i was like wow you know and I got hooked. I kept following. I, I was watching TNA, but you know TNA will sometimes will bring like uh, they, at one time I saw Roderick Strong in there. Mm -hmm. So I got hooked into the Indian. Then I got real hooked once that whole Bullet Club coming to Ring of Honor and, and you know New Japan working with them. So you know, and now I'm more into the Indies in New York. You know what I'm saying? Because I and um, I mean again, I'm 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 grateful that I was able to see you live not once but twice. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a wrestling show so you know but if people don't they, they don't do the research they're not gonna know no of course not. So, and you know. like the crazy thing is like so the reason why ring of honor started was because ecw closed yeah. all the guys that ran ring of honor used to work for ecw so after ecw well before ecw closed they were doing they were coming to jersey all pro shows usa pro shows they were filming on their Hand, you know, hand camera and selling it to get the word out there. So, like, the crazy thing is, Ring of Honor starts in that first six months because there was a lot of buzz going into the first Ring of Honor show. But in that first six months, there was a WWE house show in Philadelphia on a Saturday. They ran Saturday afternoon early. We ran that Saturday night at night. We almost outdrew the WWE house show. Wow. Because there was, I, like I said, it was a bad time because this is post attitude era. People, less people were watching WWE, and to be honest, I'm not going to say that Ring of Honor was competition because it's never been competition for WWE. You know, if anything, it's been like a proving ground for WWE. Because mm -hmm. you know, if you look at all the top guys now that have any spark, they all came from Ring of Honor. You know, um, but back then it was like, oh. Let's check out this new product that we keep hearing about. There's a lot of buzz going on. And that's what that's what happened. There were some of the guys that were at the WWE show came to Ring of Honor after to have, you know, check out the, the show. And they all said the same thing. They've been watching. They know what's up. You know, and, like, it's crazy because we're all indie guys, you know, and the majority of us were kind of like, that's cool that they're watching. And, you know, from that point on, then you could see that things just picked up. But before that, like 2000 and 2001, the indies were insane. It was like everybody was trying to be the next star or without even trying to be the next star. Like it was just great show after great show. And yeah, there'd be an occasional flop here or there. But for the most part, like I said, you had Hit Squad, Homicide, Low Key, SAT, Red, uh, Quiet Storm Divine, Special K Guys, Jay Lethal, Dixie Dragon, um, The Briscoes, Xavier, uh, Christopher Street. Yeah, all these guys that all were on the same, like, level of hungry. You know, we were all trying to just make it. Nobody had aspirations of being, like, a top WWE guy. You know what I mean? But then what we don't know is, at the same time, while that's going on, on the West Coast, you got Dan O'Brien, Samoa Joe, Spanky, Paul London. In the Midwest, you got CM Punk and Colt Cabana and, like, because there was no, I mean, there was internet, but it wasn't like it is today where you have instant yeah, access. Yeah. We would hear about, just like you said, about the magazine. You'd read about, you'd hear about certain names. And then, you know, every once in a while you cross paths on a show. If you guys got booked out of your area or they got booked into your area or whatever. And you talk. But then, you know, you go your separate way. And, oh, that's cool that, you know, they know about us or whatever. I didn't know that Jersey all and USA Pro those tapes were going out to the West and the Midwest, and all those guys knew all about us. Like, the first mm. time I met CM Punk, first thing he says is like, man, I can't wait to wrestle a hit squad. I've known about you guys for the last two years. I'm like, what? You know what I mean? And I'm saying the same thing to him. I'm knowing about him and Colt 
an ace field for the last year and change. You know what I mean? But like, it was like ring of honor was able to bring all those people together, you know? Um, and, and from that point on, when ring of honor blew up and there was an interest shown in independent wrestling, that's when you see TNA blow up because TNA happened a few months after ring of honor yeah. using pretty much most of the old WCW and the ring of honor talent. Yeah. So that's when things just went really insane, you know? And, um, yeah, it, it just, it was a great period to be around because everybody was hungry. Everybody was talented. Everybody wanted to get to the next level and they just pushed. It was, I would say part of the reason why the generation now isn't as hungry tough is because they weren't swimming with sharks. Back then we were swimming with sharks everywhere you went. If you went anywhere from Boston to Florida, it was all shark infested waters because you had AJ Styles in Georgia, you had Roderick Strong and his brother in Florida, you had us in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you had the Samoans up north, you had all those dudes up there that were just insane. You know what I mean? Like that whole the whole coast is covered with just animals and we're ready to kill. You know, that's why you see most of those guys are still around on top killing it because that was just the environment that we swam in. That's the environment that we learned in. A lot of these guys, they don't have that. There's some, don't get me wrong, there's some competition that I see. I'm like, yes. You know, like I watch, I don't know if you know who CMD is, Deshaun Pratt. And I heard, uh, I heard of him, yeah. The two of them against first class. First class, I love first class. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Johnny Santos. Two they, my favorite uh, guys, yeah. Johnny Santos yeah. and uh, Sebastian Cage. Yeah. Two of my favorite guys, right? You put them together, and that's a bunch of savages that could be back in the early 2000s with us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those guys have talent. You know, Chris Cage is another one that he's definitely, you know, has that throwback mentality, but he's been around a long time. People don't realize. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? I had him I had him in my show, uh, about, I think it was last year. I had him in my show twice last year. He's one, his, he's one of my his favorite promo, guys to watch him with. You know, his promo. He, he's his, like we do. Yeah, his promos is crazy. Guys. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I had him in my show because when I first saw him was doing the pandemic time, I'm like, who's this guy? You know, and that that's when they were doing the Sultan. Mm -hmm. And I brought him in and we kind of chatted and, and I, I spoke it to him in person and, you know, and he's just like you. He says that, you know, some of these guys are entitled. They don't listen. They want to do things. And he'd be like, you know what? I'm going to do what they want me to do. That's it. You know, because yeah. you can't fight. Yeah. You can't fight it. You know, you gotta, you gotta be like, okay, whatever. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I constantly deal with guys who are from my generation who are like, you know, screw these kids. We don't need to do jack for them. And at the same time, I truly believe that you have to learn to work with them. You yeah. can't use the old tactics because the old tactics, they'll call you a bully. They'll say that you don't know how to deal with people and that you have anger issues or whatever. Meanwhile, that's what got us to how we are, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. But whatever. But you have to be able to work with the younger generation. And I don't mean cater to them, but you have to be able to communicate with them. You know, if you can communicate with them, possibly show them, you know, if they mess up, instead of pointing out, oh, you're a dumbass because you messed up, you say, all right, well, what can you do different that might get you a better result? You know, and they can't respond to that. Maybe they're just dumb, which there are some dumb kids on, this, on the yeah. Indies, you know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, you got to be able to learn to point out how to make things better rather than, you know, call them out. And yeah, yeah, it that sucks, especially for an old guy like me. Because listen, when I screwed up, I got called everything. You know what I mean? I got told how much of a horrible wrestler I was. I was never going to make it and whatever the hell else, right? But it motivated me. To get to a certain level, yeah. these cats today work under a different motivation. Not all, again, not all, but some. Most, <laughs> I hate to say most, but there's a lot who work on a different wavelength of motivation. You know, yeah. and they all want to be praised. I'm not going to praise you unless you do something good. Got to do something good. If you do something bad, you know, hey, whatever. You know, um, I had someone the other day. They cut a promo, and promo wasn't great, right? And I'm not saying that I cut the greatest promos of all time. I'm just saying it wasn't great. It wasn't a promo that I would have cut, right? And what I did was instead of 
that sucked or whatever. Hey, you know, instead of doing this, because the person said, I'm going to come to your little show. No, it's their anniversary show. If you're going to come to the show, then obviously you're there for a reason. So instead of saying, oh, I'm going to come to your little show, when on whatever date, it's going to be, you know, the focus is going to be about the company and their anniversary. It's going to be about me and when I decided to join that company, mm -hmm. where it sounds like you're putting over the company, but you're also putting over yourself. And, you know, I said a couple of paragraphs about different tips, right? And my response was, after a whole bunch of, I respect what you said. My, I know I'm not great at my promos. My trainers have told me the same thing that you said. So I know we don't know each other well at all, really. But um, please don't send any more paragraphs like this uh, unless I ask for them. What? <laughs> wow. So now, so now. I'm in the position where I'm, my whole thing is I am a vet. I'm supposed to give advice like that. Whether And, and the thing was, the person worked for the company where I'm in charge of, a Titan, mm -hmm. one of Titan's companies. There's a couple of different, there's Goddesses, there's Funhouse, there's um, Outreach, uh, Chosen, and Titan. The person worked for three of those things, right? And I said to the person, okay. Now, I could easily just be like, you know what? I tell all my friends, because I have a lot of friends in high position. This person has less than, I want to say less than two years in-ring experience. For them to be telling me that, that I've got 26, that just goes to show the mentality of a lot of these wrestlers. Who, when we say you're entitled, that right there is proof of entitlement. But at the same time, if I go and embarrass them, you're using your position of power. The goal is for everyone to be better. If I really wanted to use my power, I would I would be a TV associate producer somewhere. I wouldn't be, you know, where I'm at. I wouldn't be working on the indies. I'd be doing what, you know, whatever makes me the most money. I'm doing what I like doing. I like helping younger people. I like running a company and putting on a show to show younger people, hey, this is what you're capable of doing. Because when it happened to me, which wasn't often, it was like, man, that's such an awesome feeling, you know? But like, that's what I'm doing. And you got someone who's not willing to work with the team. So when that happens, guess what? They got to leave the team. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Okay, that so, it makes no sense. You, I mean, first of all, the fact that he said your little show, you know, me, I'm not even a wrestler. And that promo would have been like, I will come to your biggest show of the year and I'm going to make myself known. You know, I'm going to, you know, overshadow it. But you don't know, say your little show because not only, first of all, you got to bring fans. You got to make them interested in coming to the show. You ain't going to say your little show. I mean, right there, you killing it. Nobody's going to, yeah. oh, it's a little show. Why am I going to waste my money on that? Why are you going to waste your money as a fan? And yeah. why are you, if it's a little show for you, then why are you even going? Yeah. Just stay home. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I, I mean, that's just that's just the way I think. You know what I mean? But like, no, no. But it, but it makes sense. That's I mean, because even me right now, you telling me the story, and the first thing that actually caught my attention was the part the the part that he said, "Little show." It's the anniversary show. You got to put over the company, and you got to put over yourself. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if you're trying to, let's say, if you're the heel and you say, I'm going to make myself bigger than the show, even though it's the anniversary of the show, you're still going to use the word little show. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I said, everyone's going to be talking about me and my impact when I chose your anniversary show to come and debut. Mm -hmm. Rather than say, you know, your little show, or whatever, you know what I mean? You give you you're putting over the company, it's their second anniversary. That's a big, it's their biggest show. Mm -hmm. But on your biggest show is when I'm gonna make my biggest Impact. performance. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're not putting down them, you're putting yourself over, and people are gonna be like, Oh, what are they gonna do at this show? Because it's a big show and they're making their, you know, whatever. And like I felt like that was just normal, you know what I mean? Like, like you said. You're seeing it how, you know, the way I see it. Don't put it down. It's not something to put down. It's a big show. You know, yeah. you saw the other day. You went to House of Glory, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine someone. Now, that's not their biggest show by far, right? Because House I of think, Glory. I think it was the yeah, I think it was the 10th anniversary, something like that. 
Was it the tenth anniversary? All right, yeah. so even all right, so now now it's the tenth anniversary. That's one of their biggest shows then, right? Mm-hmm. They've obviously had like they had shows with Muda, Penta, mm-hmm. uh LAX, you know, where it was huge. And that show on Friday was packed. Because I saw oh, yeah. you know, some of the videos. Was there? It was no, I didn't go. I, I uh right. which bro. I live out in Pennsylvania now, so to travel oh, okay. to Queens is a little bit of a trek for me. Yeah. But um, what you call it? um I saw you know videos and pictures, you know, like I said, I'm cool with main event. So I saw, you know, before and after and stuff like that. And I know that building for them it's always it's always packed. It's very oh, yeah. rare that they have an empty building. So imagine if you're on that show, hey, your little show, I'm just gonna I'm gonna be blessing you with my presence oh well then stay the hell home <laughs> i don't need yeah. you on that you know what i'm saying like yeah i, I think uh brian and amazing ray would have been like oh you doing a promo like that don't come yeah you know what I'm saying? yeah and, and and that fan and that fan base will let you know that will make you hear it because uh, yeah. I, I i've been going there for the last four years and my first match that i went there was lax and loki versus penta uh Tajiria and uh Tajiri Muda. And Muda, yeah. So and I, and I got hooked, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause a lot of those guys in there now, those young young cats are hungry. They're hungry, you know. And I and I I, I network with a lot of the younger talent that they that they are out there right now working with other promotions, you know what I'm saying? But uh, you know, it's I mean I mean the guys that I got that I got connected over at HOG, I could see they're hungry. They really want it. But then I bump into some of the guys. They let's say if I go to Invictus or I go to a co code name pro wrestling, whatever, and some of the guy they they too cocky. I mm-hmm. see like they too cocky. You be like, oh, can I take a picture? And oh, can I? and they're like, oh, wait a minute, I gotta do this. And you be like, okay, my dude, you do not that. You yeah, know, <laughs> I thought, I, you just lost out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, you don't even know who the fuck I'm at. I am. I could, I could be somebody that could put your name out there. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't stress it because I know that you got the certain wrestlers that are cool and they're humble and then you got wrestlers that you know they they've been in the business probably two or three years i think they're 10-year veterans so yeah and you yeah. know everybody does that that's something when you start to have people chant your name or boo you because you want them to boo you everyone gets a big head in the beginning it's yeah. just natural because if you don't then there's something wrong with you you know what i mean yeah. but when you hear your name especially a lot of kids now that have never been in sports like I play football, so I know what it's like to get cheered for a good play. I know what it's like to get booed for a bad play. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But you know, some of these cats—they never been athletic in their life. You know, so the only cheers that they know of are what's coming from their video game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like when they <laughs> hear, video but video. you know, it's true though. How many <laughs> video game nerds are in wrestling now? You know, I'm, I'm yeah, a video yeah. game geek. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I love. I have my Xbox right here. I got. My computer that I'm using is a gaming computer. You know, computer. It's I got every system that you can think of. You know what I mean? But I also came from a generation where I played baseball, basketball, football, even tennis, golf. I did everything under the sun that's competitive because that was the generation that we grew up with. We had Nintendo, we had Sega, but we also had outside. A lot of these kids didn't have that outside. You know, so when they come to wrestling and they hear a cheer, you know, even if it's like two people cheering their name. Yo, I had two people cheering my name, you know, or, uh, you know, they have, they have like a main event match and half the crowd's cheering for them, half the crowd's cheering for their opponent. They still have half the crowd cheering for them. You know what I mean? And they get, you know, if they did good, they get a standing ovation. That's an addiction. You get a thrill rush to that, you know, and you just, I need more of it. I need more of it. And then you start to believe the hype. It happens to everybody. It happened to me. It happened to everybody. It doesn't matter who it is. When you get that, that level of excitement coming your way. There's nothing like standing in the middle of the ring. Everybody's watching you. Everybody's cheering you. You feel all of that energy and excitement coming into the ring with you. There's no way you can tell me you can't because I feel it every time. You know, it's just everything's focused on you. So if you have, let's say there's 50 people, you have, you know, it's spread out between four sides. You feel that. But then when you have 300 I wrestle in front of 20,000 people. You have 20,000 people booing you, wanting to kill you. You feel that heat and anger and energy and excitement. And all you want, you can run through walls with that. You know what I'm saying? 
it's hard. You know, a lot of wrestlers go through depression because when the cheering stops, they go home, they got nobody. They don't hear nothing. They just hear their brain. You suck. You're miserable. You're not good enough. Whatever it is, they hear that in their brain. And it starts to mess with them. That's where the drugs come in. That's where the alcohol comes in. Everything that's bad happens at those moments. You know what I mean? You never hear of anybody getting arrested at 12 in the afternoon. It's always yeah. overnight because after the show, they go back to their hotel room, they go back to their house, and they're miserable. You know, a lot of these kids, they get that high and excitement, and they feel it. And they feel themselves and listen, it's natural. Yeah, I did good. I did that. That's what's up. Yeah, you want to take a picture of me? You got to wait five minutes because I need to do my nails before I give you that picture. <laughs> Whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the reality hits after that point. When they start to have it a couple <laughs> of times when they go home, and there's nobody there. You know, maybe they're lucky they have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or their family to support them. But not everybody who's in wrestling has that. A lot yeah, of people yeah, yeah. wrestling don't have a mother and a father. They have one, if not none. You know what I mean? They don't have brothers and sisters, or if they do, they live somewhere else. You know, they don't have that support. So once that happens, then that's when the downward slide starts. To you know, yeah. and, and that's that's one of it's not just wrestling; it's all sports because football it happens. I mean, look how many guys, not just CTE, but how many guys kill themselves at home after they retire because they don't have the love and support that they're used to their whole life coming up, and within ten years they kill themselves. Yeah, Trudy I know Sale. why. Yeah, Sale, I, one of my favorite players, and I think about him all the time. That he felt. And listen, there was a lot of CTE. I, I'm willing to bet because he played his entire life. And if you look at everything Junior Seau did off the field while he was playing, there's no reason why you don't think he's a great man. You know, he did a lot of charity. He did a lot of fundraising. He just spoke great, eloquent, everything, right? And then you got to think what got him to that point where. He was in his bed one day and just decided to shoot his heart and say, check my brain. I think I got something wrong. You know what I mean? Like, he, ever made, he, ever, did he ever made it to the Hall of Fame? I don't think so, right? Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. He did, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was right before he passed, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be wrong. But I'm pretty sure he went to the Hall of Fame. But, you know, that, that level of interaction, it, it hypes you up. And then it brings you right down, you know? And that's something that, I'm not worried about myself because I've had my moments where I'm like, damn, I had such a high. Now I'm at such a low because I'm by myself. But you make it through that night. If you make it through that night, you can make it through any night. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And that's something that, you know, sometimes it's hard to deal with, but you deal with it. You just keep going. You find whatever it is that keeps you going. And a lot of wrestlers don't have something. Yeah. That's something that bothers me a lot because if I'm going through it, and everyone's like, oh, you're a legend, right? All right, that's cool. I may be a legend, but I still have a hard time. I still have a lot of things on my mind that's going on in the world. This world sucks now. Yeah, we're yeah. Kids, we ain't got to worry about half the stuff that's going on. But now, every time we turn on the TV, there's something horrible going on. Yeah, and it feels like it's the end. But whether it is or it isn't, I got a kid that I got to worry about what's going to happen with her future. Just like there's other people got to worry about their kids and their grandkids. Your yeah. your daughter's ten, right? Yeah, she's gonna be ten yeah, my, two weeks. My, so. Yeah, mine's gonna be sixteen in October. Yeah. So I had a, I, I know the feeling, bro. I know the feeling. It's yeah, crazy. it's hard to want to you know keep going, but as long as I have my daughter breathing, hey, that's gonna keep be keeping me alive. That's yeah. gonna be keeping me from doing anything stupid. You know what I mean? Like I have that focus, but not everybody has that focus. Yeah. You know, you gotta you gotta realize that like some of these cats. They need they need some help, you know. I worry about a guy like Joey Janela. Joey Janela, I've known that kid since he's you know in his teenage years, right? But Joey Janela, he's gone through a lot, and I know his body's killing him because he's put himself through a lot. And <laughs> I don't know what's going shit. on in his personal life, whether he has a girlfriend, whether he has a boyfriend, whether he has anything. But I know that a lot of the time when we would be on shows together, he didn't have anything at home. So mm. for me, I'm like, I hope he has something to come home to and want to keep going. Because I know that once you come off that high, it's, you know, it could be the end for anybody, especially if they don't have those people there. So like guys like him, I worry about all the time, especially if it's younger guys that I saw them start and I was already wrestling. See them get up to a high level and then they get cut 
or released or fired, and now they're back to the Indies. It's depression. You know what I'm saying? It shouldn't be, but it is, you know, because you're used to a certain thing. So, yeah. you know, stuff like that is stuff. That's why I like being in the position that I'm at because, you know, yeah, you could be up top helping. It's dope. You make money. Yeah, it's stupid not to want to do it. But at the same time, when you're on the indie level, that's where everybody's going up, and that's where people are coming down. So they meet, and you're there to help. You know, it don't matter what I do with the rest of my life. If I help people, I'm happy with that. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I look at a lot of things, with like the indies. Like before, when you were saying, you know, it's, it's at a high level, or it could be, you know, high. Depending. It could be, you're right. But it could also go down because there's a lot of people that you don't know could just drop off. Yeah, there was a uh, what's her name? Daphne Shannon. Uh, last year, she who, 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 who uh, Daphne in WCW. She oh, yeah, yeah, up. yeah, yeah. She, you know, she she killed herself. Yeah, all she needed was someone to be there for her. And I knew her, she was a sweet person, she was so funny, such a nice person. We used to work shows all the time, we used to always joke about stupid New York stuff and just everything because we. For a long time, we were on the same shows. And, like, you see her, you know, kill herself. And it's like, if she just had that one person there for her, you know. So, like, that's the stuff. I'm not sorry to get all depressing on it, you know. But, no, like, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a part like, of life. A lot yeah. of us, you know, I mean, I, I could bring up a, a, a quick subject here. That's like that girl, Lufisto, from Canada, mm -hmm. who right now is just going off on Twitter talking about how she... Uh, been 26 years in the, in the business, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I understand. I mean, it is hard. You put it, you put your heart and soul in doing something for 26 years and whatnot. And the, the whole thing that I read, uh, the way I look at it, I'm like, okay, so you put, you put in 26 years in the business, whatever, but you had to come uh, be accountable of your skills if you felt that your skill wasn't taking you to that level or who was guiding you at that time, you know? So it's, and it seems like to me, the way I look at it, I read the whole thing. She, I think she sent a letter to MJF and it's depressing because it's like, she's saying what she went through in the whole nine. But at the same time, if you've been in the business for 26 years, you know, you know, especially when it comes to woman wrestling, I mean, you probably could agree with me with this woman wrestling, never been pushed to the level of men wrestling, you know, probably maybe in the, the woman's revolution at that time was real, real hot, you know, but before that, I mean, you say, oh, we're going to create a woman's division or a woman's federation. How many people are going to go watch that? You know? So she well, yeah, I mean, ratings show whenever you, like, I listen to Jim Cornette a lot because, you know, he talks about stuff the way I like to see things in wrestling. Mm -hmm. you know, not that I'm an old mind or I don't want things to progress. I want things to be progressive. I've always said it. I'm all about being all-inclusive, whether it's male, woman, trans, whatever. I will put them on the show if they have the talent. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take away from some other spot just to have a whatever on the show. Doesn't matter what it is, right? But I'm all about, you know, if, if you have the talent, you're going to bring people to the show. You're going to make other, other wrestlers better, and they're going to make you better. I'm all for it. But if you are on, trying to get on a show just because you're yellow or just because you're purple or just because you're green or whatever it is, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm not about that life. Lafisto, I've known for a long time. She does have the talent. She trained in Japan. She trained in Canada. She's been all over the United States. She could do wrestling. She could do a death match. She could do every style you ask, right? She is a little older. She should have had some sort of break. But I think where things got mixed up in is that people – don't understand. Like right now, the the popular thing to do is trash CM Punk, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the new thing. Yeah, I've known CM Punk since two thousand one. Right, that was the first time I met CM Punk. Ever since, whether it was Ring of Honor, Jersey All Pro, JCW, any company that we wrestled together, he's always been cool. We've always had a cool relationship. I haven't seen him in probably like maybe ten years, give or take. Um, but like every time we saw each other, always cool. I'm not going to tell you that he's a jerk like everybody else is because I've never had that experience. 
So whatever Lufisto's experience was when she went to AEW, that was her experience. If people feel otherwise, which, you know, they're more entitled to, then yeah, sure. But you can't trash Lufisto for sharing her experience because it, it was a bad one. It wasn't what everybody else is trying to say that AEW is. But, at, you know, what her experience is her experience. You know, if she felt that something happened because something outside of her control happened, that's her experience. That's her side of the story. I can't tell you that, yes, and I've been in an AEW locker room, so I can't tell you that, you know, Britt Baker held her down or Dusty Rhodes was a jerk or whoever, uh, Ruby Soho. Every time I met Britt Baker, always been a positive experience. I've known Ruby Soho since before she was with WWE. Always a positive experience. Dusty Rhodes, always been a positive experience. You know what I mean? Maybe that day, those three were having a bad day, and it rubbed off on Lufisto the wrong way, and she caught the rat. I don't know. I wasn't there. None of us were there, but the people that were there. So I hate that people get so invested in their side of the story or the other side of the story because they refuse to accept that, hey, maybe this did happen. Maybe it did happen this way. And instead, they're going to be like, oh, you know, Lufisto, she don't know what she's talking about. She she really didn't make. MJF, I've known him since he practically started. I met him the year he started, 2015, right? Always, yeah, I saw him last year, always a great interaction. Same, right? So I can't be there and say, oh, you know, screw MJF for saying that or yay MJF for saying that. I can only tell you that every time I met MJF and wrestled with him or worked with him, so it's been, we always had laughs, we always had a good time. I can't sit there and say what happened with Lufisto and what's going on because that's, you know, I'm not in that story. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. a lot of people get way too heavily invested, especially now that there's an AEW versus WWE war. It doesn't matter. It's wrestling. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, and I, and I don't even think, honestly, it's even a war. They're just the fan wants to make it a war. Well, that's just, but that's what I'm saying. It's not a war. Because if you look, WWE is killing AEW every week in ratings by double. AEW is mm-hmm. trying, but, you know, right now it's just a WWE show, you know. And, and it's nothing that AEW sucks or anything like that because they don't suck. There's a lot of great wrestling on AEW, mm-hmm. a lot of great wrestlers. But for whatever reason, people just aren't watching as much as they do WWE. WWE is the band-aid of marketing. You know what I'm saying? Like, Band-Aid, everybody associates the name Band-Aid with the bandages that go on your finger. But it's not what it's called. It's called the bandage. Band-Aid is the brand. That's WWE. Just like whenever you talk about soda, everybody's drinking Coke. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pepsi's there, but everybody's drinking Coke. And that's what WWE is. When you talk about wrestling, it's WWE. That's priority, primary, whatever. AEW, secondary. And I'm not saying that in a Triple H disparaging type of way. Because once he said that, he was... He was dissing. He was taking a shot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm fine with it, you know? Yeah. But that's that's what it is, though, because that's the alternative. They're not yeah. the primary. WWE is the primary, you know? If right now, if you said bloodline, you know that's WWE. You know what I'm saying? That's not anybody else. That's WWE. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you got to, like, you got to look at it how it really is, you know? Yeah, they're yeah, trying. Yeah. They're going to make it eventually. They, I mean, next week. What is it, 86,000 tickets? That's so 84,000, 84, some shit. Yeah. Like that. And that was most of that was sold before they even announced the match. Yeah. It's just that they were going to be there. Is it going to ever happen again? Probably not. Hey, but you think about it. Their, and, and, their debut it's, in that it's, country. Yeah, it's, it's UK. In UK, you're going to get people yeah. to see your shows because they don't get this. So, exactly. Because uh, it's not just the UK. You got people from France, Germany, Poland, yeah. Ireland, all the countries nearby that you can cross the tunnel, and you're in the UK. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's yeah. all those people. So, yeah, it, I mean, you might have 20,000 from the actual UK area, you know, London, Wales, whatever. But then the rest of that is all coming from the outside countries, you know, yeah. and not just from the one place. You know, yeah. here, oh, we have Chicago, we have New York, we have Los Angeles, we have Miami, you know. People will hold off because they know WWE is going to be in their area within a couple of months or AEW. You know what I'm saying? Plus, as long as there's indies, there's always going to be people interacting with that and they're going to be happy with it because they're still getting their wrestling fix. 
you know, yeah. over there, the, the indies, it's strong, not as strong as it used to because WWE came and raided it and took a lot of the best talent and kind of left everybody with nothing. But it's starting to rebuild. It's starting to come up. So you still have that. But that's part of the reason why everybody wants to come see AEW. Because yeah. a lot of the, 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 the work and talent that's there was from the UK scene. Or they worked in the UK scene. So they want to see them come back. You know, it, it, Hopefully, it does build to them getting bigger and better. But we can't see the future. You know, Anything can happen. Who knows? We might even be hit with another pandemic. God forbid. Oh, God forbid, no. But it's possible. <laughs> We've seen that happen once. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Might happen again. Yeah. Well, Steve, listen, I'm sorry I tried to interrupt you earlier, but you added another hour of a lot of information, man. I'm like, <laughs> you are giving me everything from the, all the facts. There's a whole lot there. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. But um, uh, but then again, you know, let everybody know where they could reach you, all your social media outlets. What's your next? I mean, we all know the next match coming up is with you and PJ Savage. Let everybody know, all my fans, uh, let them know where they can reach you. Um, so you can hit me up on Twitter, uh, at Steve Mack, M-A-C-K, D-H-S. Um, I've had that Twitter forever. Uh, that's pretty much where I like to inter interact with fans. Uh, if you hit me up, I will check and I will answer back. Um, as far as wrestling, I'm primarily wrestling for Titan. Uh, they're down in Jersey Shore area, but... We're expanding. We we just did North Carolina last week. I know uh, New York's. We're looking for a New York venue, uh, and then a couple of places all around. Uh, so you can always check my page or Titans page um, to get information on that. And uh, in September, I'm also going to be at Catalyst uh, in Brooklyn uh, at Chilo's Restaurant in. Um, I always forget the name of the area, but it's that it's Brooklyn. It's by downtown. <laughs> it's on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn. Uh, actually, I grew up not too far from there. It's like on uh, 30 some Street, and I grew up on 92nd Street. In Brooklyn. So it's September so, like, 1? September what? Se uh, September 24th, I think it is. Hold on one oh. second. It's uh, whatever that Saturday is. I think it's 24th. I could be wrong. I'm never right on these things anymore. As you get older, you care less. Um, yeah, I think it's September 24th or 23rd, but I'll post. I'm pretty right. sure it's 24th. I'll post. Um, you know, the information on my uh, Twitter so you can check it out along with Catalyst's website. Catalyst is all over the place. Uh, that's another fun place where I get to work with a lot of young guys like Deshaun and Boom and Dominic De Niro. And uh, like I said before, main event. Um, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate in that in my uh, older age, I get to work with a lot of the best up and coming talent uh, between the two places. So. By the way, you missed out. You, you became a fan too late because we wrestled, Hit Squad wrestled for House of Glory against Private Party. Oh. At that what moment, year, what year was that? Match, look for that match. I don't know wherever House of Glory posts their stuff, but yeah, you up one of the guys, but look it up. Trust me, it's worth the watch. Yeah, I'm going to not say you're going to make me look for it now. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that they, they, put, they put this stuff on YouTube. So, yeah. I'll I know that uh, IWTV has it under Beyond's uh, page. No. Um, it was House of Glory X Beyond was the name of the show. X Beyond. Oh, it was okay. in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I I started doing I started this podcast in 2019, and and then I had this thing about oh I want to bring in wrestlers, and then first one I saw was you, and I was like I got to get in contact with this guy, and um, I remember sending I still remember sending you the picture holding the New York City belt on your hand, and you responded back, so I was like yo one day I'm gonna get him. And whatnot, but again, thank you for coming in, bro. I you appreciate it. We gotta do this again. Hopefully, yes. I'll see you around soon. Good luck in your match against PJ Savage. Uh, again, guys, you can follow my uh, my my podcast and the YouTube on Spotify, Apple, all the audio medias. You can find me there. You can catch me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the Chokeslam Wrestling Report. So check me out. So until then, guys, be safe, and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks a lot, Steve.